Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a really interesting program today with the folks from permanent.org. Uh, just a few things. Uh, we're just going to, I'm going to share my screen and then we'll go right ahead. Just takes a minute to do the uh, screen sharing. All right, here we are. So if you're in the right place, you're here for planning and preserving your digital legacy. And this is a really interesting topic uh, that uh, the permanent.org folks have developed um, because it really is about sharing and saving your material for the next generation. What is your digital legacy? And we're gonna talk about that. So please take a moment and introduce yourself in the chat. What's your name, where you're joining us from, and share one word that comes to mind when you hear legacy planning. I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. Thank you for being here today. I can't wait to see what your one word for legacy planning is going to be. So you can put that right in the chat. There is a bit of a delay. All right. Far. Overwhelm. Well, that's a good word. Estate. Keep them coming. I'm joined today by Amanda Meeks, Community and Partnerships of the uh, Manager for the Permanent Legacy Foundation, and Robert Friedman, Executive Director of the Permanent Legacy Foundation. Um, you're probably familiar with Robert. We've done some other things, both with metadata and uh, with the photo detective. Uh, lives and podcasts and things like that. But Amanda is um, new to this platform. Man Welcome to both of you and thank you for um, offering to present today. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Maureen. Um, do you want to go on to the next slide? I awesome. do. Thank you. All right. Um, so Amanda's going to do most of this and I have a few slides mixed in here. And Robert, uh, I'm sure you and Amanda have uh, worked out who's presenting what, but go right ahead, Amanda. Thank you. All right, so we have a pretty packed agenda today. Um, and keep you know introducing yourselves and keep um, going in the chat if you have any questions. I think there's an ask a question button at the bottom um, that you can put your questions in. And um, the objectives for today are really simple, um, but we have a lot to cover. So we're going to first talk about what a digital legacy is, and um, we're going to discuss why it's important to create and share your digital legacy um, and your plans with others. And then we're going to provide you with a sneak peek of the permanent.org's new legacy planning feature, which we've been working on for um, quite a, a good chunk of time now, and it's been part of our manifesto um, from the very beginning of Permanence um, founding. And um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the um, feedback that we're looking for and show you the prototype that um, you can actually click through and get a better sense of the upcoming feature for yourself. So we'll dive right in with what is a digital legacy? And um, if you don't mind, next slide. Yeah. We're gonna start with just the, the word legacy because um, sometimes that word is confusing to people. And um, when we're moving into digital legacy, we wanna have a good sense of what a legacy is as well. So some examples that people leave as legacies include their family, including children, grandchildren, their history, their family traditions, their family stories. Those are all part of your legacy. Um, creative work is also part of one's legacy. Um, and that can include books that you've published, art that you've made, music, and so on. And then there's material um, legacy, which can include your wealth, your property, your businesses. Um, and lastly, the one that we're focusing on, of course, is your digital assets. Next slide. 
So when we talk about digital legacy, we are really talking about what you leave behind in the form of digital assets. So um, creating your digital legacy can not only help you, but those around you make meaning of your life stories and or work long after you're gone. Um, digital assets can be anything from your Instagram photos to um, data on a jump drive with family history documentation, to your collection of unpublished essays from college um, that are stored locally on your computer. All of that can be part of your um, digital assets that you want to preserve for the future. And um, actively creating your digital legacy can definitely help you, as I said, um, make meaning of your life. Next slide. Hold on. I'm trying to answer a question and it's made the PowerPoint go away. There we go. All right. All right. So why bother creating and sharing a legacy plan? Um, this is really important to the work that we do at Permanent. And we can go on to the next slide. So the planning process is really just deciding how your assets will be managed um, and bequeathed when you're gone. It's a set of instructions for um, someone else to follow based on how you want to be remembered. This is like a very simple um, way and definition of legacy planning. Next slide. This planning process allows you to deter to determine if, when, how, and with whom you'd like your assets shared. Um, so one example of that includes um, whether you want to make your digital assets accessible to the public, whether you want to keep them private, or share them just with individuals of your choosing, say, your close family and friends. So Amanda, this really can put you in the driver's seat. Like you yeah. decide. You're yeah. the one who's deciding what you're going to do with all the stuff you've accumulated in your life. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a really important process in um, in planning for you, all of the things that you've amassed or created or that you cherish. So uh, we can go to the next slide. I think it is it's digital legacy planning. Mm -hmm. Um, so this also ensures that someone close to you has access to your assets and can carry out your wishes for them. So when you make a plan, um, it's extremely important to communicate that plan um, because of this. Because if nobody knows that your plan exists, then it won't be enacted. Um, digital assets are an important part of estate planning. I saw somebody had put estate as their word that they thought of when they thought of legacy planning. And that is very accurate. Um, it has become a very important part. And um, you can make these plans legal by incorporating them into your will. Next slide. So without digital legacy planning, um, your digital assets might be lost and become inaccessible to those closest to you. Um, your future family members might lose a potentially rich source of meaning and narrative for establishing their place in history and that really only your digital assets can provide. Future students and researchers who are trying to learn about the past um, will also miss out on your stories and um, They'll, they'll miss out on your unique perspective that your experience of the world might bring um, to their own understanding of history and politics and environment and so on. So um, it's a very, it's, it's important for multiple reasons, but at the most basic personal level, it's important to those closest to you. And this is, I'm gonna turn it over to Maureen. This is my section, right? So how do you get ready? How do you get ready for legacy planning? And I saw the word pop up as overwhelmed. And this is a common feeling like you have all of this material. What are you going to save? What is the most important? How are you going to, you know, who are you going to share it with? All of that. 
So one of the things I want to talk about is um, the three-step process of sorting through what you have, um, deciding what's important and what isn't important. Maybe you need someone in the family to help you with that because it really can be overwhelming and you do have to, unfortunately, let go of some things. Um, and then scan, file, photograph the items that you're interested in saving. Um, I always think in terms of photographs because that's what I do as the photo detective. And then once you have uploaded things to your di digital legacy plan through like permanent, you can add metadata. You can add metadata on your computer as well if you have a digital photo organizer, but metadata is something that helps you sort through and be able to find the items. Um, you also, when you're sorting and scanning, so when you sort, you break it down into piles of things. Like this is all things I want to put in one file, like say your grandfather's photographs or your grandfather's school papers, and then your school papers. So you divide it up into subjects, which would naturally go into folders on your computer, which then you can upload um, into your uh, permanent account. So sorting also involves photo negatives and slides and snapshots, photo albums. Think about everything that you have, including documents and memorabilia, because that, that sort of disposable paper stuff that we call ephemera in the archival world actually is pretty important, not only to telling the tiny little nuanced stories of your life and your ancestral life, but also it can be important historically. Lots of little things go missing and historians are like, I wonder what they did at that event or did they really have a party? Uh, when was, the, like for instance, it's gonna be October soon. When was the first Halloween party in um, whatever city that you live in? When was that important? What did they wear? Can you find it? Do you have things relating to it in your collection? So sort photographs and negatives. I never tell people to get rid of their negatives because you can get a much better uh, scan of a lot of the negatives than you can of some of these, like say 1970s prints, which are always awful. If you are gonna scan, you wanna keep in, in mind how you're gonna scan. So what are you gonna use? Do you have a flatbed scanner? I do, um, I consider them the most flexible option. You have scanned because you can scan cased images and tin types and negatives and slides. You can scan everything. If you have an all-in-one machine, which is a fax machine, copier, you really can only scan the snapshots. Um, you can't scan all of your historical things that uh, it just it just reads it reads the glass rather than your image. Um, Sheet-fed scanners. These are very popular. They are only for contemporary. Uh, snapshots. You, if you put any historical items through the sheet fed scanner, they could get caught and rip. Um, there are newer smartphone uh, cameras now that take very high resolution images. I'm thinking of my iPhone, for instance. Those pictures are huge. And then with them, there are apps you can use like Google Photo Scan or Photo Mime. Um, Photomime has a partnership now with Ancestry.com. MyHeritage my even has um, a camera option now for photographing items and uploading them into their app. Um, so there's a lot of options for you if you don't have a flatbed scanner, although it's worth the investment if you have a lot of things. When you're scanning yourself, I recommend that you scan everything at a minimum of 600 DPI uh, minimum uh, TIFF file, but a 1200 DPI TIFF is preservation level. You are going to need a portable hard drive or a cloud service for huge files, and actually your portable hard drive and cloud service act as a backup for that as well. So does your private family archive on permanent.org. Um, scan in color, even if it's a sepia or black and white, because you want that really good tonal quality. Um, Elizabeth said, I can't scan negatives with just any old flatbed scanner, though. Mm, you can scan an awful lot of negatives with a, a flatbed scanner. The PhotoMime app actually has a way of you photographing negatives, and then it converts it from a negative to a positive. So that's pretty cool. 
And then metadata. I mentioned metadata. I'm chair of the Family History Metadata Working Group now called SaveMetadata.org, and we're all about metadata. Robert's on the committee as well uh, on the board. It's the information about the digital image that's captured in specific fields within your image file. Um, we just last week had a presentation called The Superpowers of Metadata, where we used real life examples of photographs taken from the news. When then when you look at the metadata, is it an insurance scam or not? Well, we uh, dug deep into some of those things. And there are well-established standards that define metadata structure, properties, and fields. Um, and all of the standards, including the standards developed by the SaveMetadata.org group, basically want consistency and a blueprint for all organizations that deal with family history to use the same standards so that we can all talk to each other and all of this stuff is portable from one platform to another. Now that is not the case now. What kind of metadata details would you like to add to photos? Well, if you scan it that or photograph it, that is metadata that will be automatically embedded into your image. But you might want to add the names of all the people, the date of the event, the location, if you don't already have, like it's a historical location versus a location, like a present day wedding, for instance. You can add a caption or a description. You can add different albums or event things. And then for bonus details, you can do things like keywords, like all the mustached men in your family or the hat wearers. Uh, and then you can even include the file name so that you then you can go and find the original photograph when you need it. So metadata not only helps you manage the digital stuff, but if you add some of these bonus details, you'll be able to then go right to where you've stored um, the originals, which is cool. Why metadata matters? I mentioned portability because the same metadata fields used to write and read photo details that the story will travel from platform to platform. So right now, you know, a lot of people use Facebook. When you upload a photograph to Facebook, Facebook, um, for privacy reasons, strips out all your metadata. Um, so even if you download that image, it's not going to be portable. Um, a lot of the genealogy sites, you can upload images, you can add metadata, but then when you try to export it, it doesn't go with the picture. So metadata actually helps you with searchability. It lets you find your photos fast. I use a photo, a digital photo organizer. I put my photos in there. I've tagged everyone in my family. When I want to find a picture of my grandmother, I can search in the search box and have all of the pictures of her in just a few seconds. And then metadata is a preservation standard as well because the information in the metadata is a self-contained shareable story archive because you can put a lot of information in a caption. It is important to back up your material and a legacy plan actually is part of your dis disaster planning as well. We are getting into the hurricane season here. Um, fires, floods, tornadoes uh, certain times of the year it seems like you can't turn on the TV without seeing people crying over lost family memories the photographs are blown all over the place a legacy plan actually preserves that material in a digital form in the case in in the event of an unexpected occurrence and digitization makes saving your family easy really easy so you won't ever lose a picture all right, so I'm turning this over to one of you. What's unique about the Permanence new legacy planning feature? Thanks, Maureen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me tell you a little bit about what we've been working on. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is still a work in progress. Um, we're designing this feature right now. And so we're here today to share a little bit about what we've been thinking. Um, and uh, get some feedback from y'all. We're really looking for user uh, member uh, community feedback on what we've put together so far. So these are designs. Um, these features are not functional in our applications yet, uh, but we hope to have them available in early 2023, or at least some bits and pieces ready by then. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is a little bit about our vision, how we went about designing it, 
um, and an opportunity for you all to uh, try it out yourselves, give us some feedback, uh, and even get a little bit of a um, thank you gift uh, Robert, for, for doing that. Let me, so, let me interrupt um, for just a second. Um, can you just, just in case someone in the audience doesn't know what permanent.org is, do you have sort of a elevator pitch for permanent? Because I know what it is. Amanda knows what it is. Uh, we all have accounts where we upload images, but I'm not sure people understand what the Permanent Legacy Foundation is all about. Sure. Thank you, uh, Maureen, for pointing that out. Um, yeah, we're a, the first thing I'd like y'all to know is that we're a nonprofit organization. So the Permanent Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit behind permanent.org. Uh, and our mission is to preserve and make accessible the legacy of all people for future generations. Um, what we've been building at permanent.org is an online cloud document, photo, file storage system. Um, something similar to what you may be familiar with on Dropbox and Drive uh, or with other platforms like Forever or SmugMug um, where you are uploading and saving your materials. Um, what makes us special uh, is that this is a platform that's designed for uh, individuals, families, and small organizations, um, consumers, uh, you know, regular folks. Um, this is not an enterprise platform. This is not a, it's a commercial platform for, um, for everyone, uh, but uh, it's backed by a nonprofit organization. So our mission uh, and our sustainability model are designed to, uh, you know, are designed and intended to, to serve individuals um, and for social good, uh, for the purpose of, of historical preservation. And everything we do, everything we build is driven by And you by pay one, it's so, a one-time um, fee for your storage, uh, other than paying yearly yeah. like you do with other plans. Yeah, sus subscriptions expire. So there's nothing permanent about a subscription-based model. If you're paying month to month, uh, it goes away when you can't anymore, um, when that month comes. Uh, so our approach is a one-time payment model. Uh, you can pay by the gigabyte. So there's no big packages you have to pre-buy. Um, you know, you buy the storage as you need it. As you fill it up, you can add more. Uh, each gigabyte is $10. Um, it's free to start, so you can create an account we, we give you a free gigabyte to get started. So there's no risk in getting started. And um, yeah, I think that uh, the goal here, uh, and you can read more about um, our endowment model and how we use those $10. Um, there's no profit incentive. So there's no owner, there's no private owner, uh, permanent can't be bought or sold. Um, and so that changes a little bit about what we do with the money. We take that $10 and we invest it um, and we hold on to it for the future. So uh, our month to month expenses are not paid out of that 10 bucks, it's paid out of the, the interest on that $10, if you will. So a different approach to how to pay for and sustain digital storage. Yeah, and to back up everything. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a great solution for that. I didn't yeah. mean to, I didn't mean to derail your, no, no, your please. presentation. No, uh, no, please. It's about backing up the important things. And as Amanda yeah. led off with earlier, um, the idea of uh, legacy planning was always a core part of the permanent manifesto, what we were uh, trying to trying to do, uh, our, our goals in the world. So um, this this some of the stuff we're, I'm going to share with you today uh, is design work that has been um, a long time coming. Uh, we had to do a lot of other work to get to this point because not a lot of point in having a uh, legacy planning feature if you don't have a way to upload and organize things. So we started there. Um, but when we thought about how we were going to implement this feature, um, we did start with some landscape research. Uh, we looked at other platforms, Facebook, Google, um, Apple, and, and, and looked at what they were doing. Um, and we, you know, we found that, uh, oh, actually, uh, Maureen, if you don't mind, I'm on the previous slide still. Oops. Uh, I just was on it for a long time. Sorry. I was talking about permanent. No, it's okay. Um, I'm going to use some of the talking points from that slide. So, um, uh, on my screen, it's on the precise control account settings one, but I'd like to be one back, but it's okay. I'm going to keep going one way or the other. Um, this so one. we did some landscape That's research. Let me see. Uh, there might be a little bit of a delay. Um, 
precise control account settings? No, I want the one right before it. That one, designing the legacy planning feature. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. there you go. That is on the screen. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, as I was saying, so we did quite a bit of research to look at what other folks were doing. And depending on the platform, there were some, um, uh, there were some inspiring steps different folks had taken, different uh, platforms had taken, but we found a lot of missing opportunity everywhere we looked. And so that kind of guided us. Another thing we really focused on was work from one of our own uh, staff people, actually our director of engineering, Cecilia Crum, had done a fellowship uh, with the Aspen Institute studying digital legacy in digital platforms. Um, and so they had produced a really beautiful report uh, that laid out a couple guiding principles, uh, safe, simple, and respectful that we used um, when thinking about what our features should, should look and feel like. Likewise, we consulted with another researcher um, out, of, uh, out of Europe uh, who had worked on concepts around Thanos sensitivity, um, sort of sensitivity towards the concepts or the issues around death. Um, and they had really thought about those issues in the digital space as well. So uh, ideas like those drove a lot of our work, very excited to have encountered them. Um, so now, like I said, we're in the sort of design, gathering, and feedback part. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what we put together, um, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to dig deeper. If you really like what you see and you want to test it out and give us some feedback, I'll, I'll share an opportunity to do that at the end. Now I'm ready for the next slide, Maureen. There you go. Precise control it is. Um, great. So we, uh, right. When, if you know, if you, if you get started with permanent, the first thing you might notice and you should sort of be aware of is there's sort of two parts to permanent. There's the account part that is, you know, your email address, your credit card information, your at home address, like the kinds of things that, um, uh, you use to manage your materials, your account, and then there's your archives. You might have one archive or many different archives um, that collect materials for different people, families, or organizations. Uh, there's no limit to the number of archives you can create on permanent. So we're going to address the account and the archives in two steps in the digital legacy planning, because the first thing we need to know at any point um, is what's going on with you. Uh, and we're going to need to know if, if you have passed, um, if you're incapacitated, uh, if you need to activate your legacy planning, and we do that at the account level. And so this is what sort of an account legacy plan looks like when you're done. You may have identified a legacy contact uh, whom you would like to contact us. So you've designated a person and you've notified them, uh, or, and, and or, uh, in case they don't contact us, you may have identified a date at which point you want this activated, even if we never receive contact. And likewise, you may also want to set an activity um, limit. So if there's no activity on your account for 5, 10, 50 years, uh, we'll automatically activate these um, directives. So you have a few different options that you can combine together uh, for us to activate your legacy plan, whether it's sort of through a more manual legacy contact that notifies us or whether it's through an automated process. And then as I noted, you know, things like your storage balance, uh, any account balance that you have, maybe a part of your account as well. And so we've thought about what might you want to do with that unused storage? Uh, you might transfer it to someone or you might donate it to an organization. So there's some opportunities to do that. And that's what your complete plan looks like. Uh, next slide. And yes, I just saw the question, Thanos sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity towards um, the issues surrounding death. Uh, and yeah, the um, as I noted, we have, and uh, just make sure Maureen, I'm on the automated and manual yep. activation options slide. Great. Yep. Um, there's a little bit of a delay when, when I see them switch, so I just double check. Uh, right, and so there are a couple different legacy plan activation options that I've discussed. Uh, there's the legacy content, contact, fixed date, or period of inactivity. You can pick um, 
the legacy contacts more of a manual process where someone would reach out to us they'd have instructions on how to do that whereas the others would be automated in the event that we'd never heard from anybody uh next slide marine this is the and then we have uh the what to do with your your storage balance um should we donate that for example you might donate to permanent bite for bite grant program um, our Bike for Bike grant program gives free storage to nonprofit organizations. And so if you had a storage balance, we could give it to one of the organizations in our program that applied for free storage so that that storage gets used. Or you may have other active members of your family um, or important trusted contacts for whom you, who you might want to continue the work that you started. Um, and you might want to grant that storage to them instead. So you have some control over um, your assets. Uh, and then the next slide those folks if you did choose a legacy contact would have the option of sort of joining permanent now and becoming part getting acquainted with the platform now maybe joining your archive as a member um or they'll be able to do that when they contact us if they would like uh but at the account level it's not i want to make something clear that i think i skipped we don't hand over the keys to your account to anybody we want to avoid sort of a digital impersonation scenario where someone takes over your account. Uh, that's not how we how we manage things. The legacy contact informs us about your passing, but they don't get control of your account. What they might get control of, if you want them to, are different archives that you've sort of bequeathed to them. And I will um, I will explain that in a second. So you can contact them now, have them join permanent, or we'll uh, you know, or we'll just be on the one way or the other, we'll be on the lookout for them if they ever reach out to us. So we can leave it up to yourself to, to do that work. Um, all right, and then the next slide, Maureen. So we've kind of walked through setting up an account level legacy plan that is gonna be how we know that your account is no longer active and what we'd like you'd like to do with it. Uh, I didn't quite cover the fact that you could delete your account if you just want it removed entirely, or you could choose to preserve your account if you want it to continue to appear in our platform um, so that, you know, if you are a member of things, it'll notify other archives, et cetera, that you've participated in places where your account appears that you're no longer active, um, that you've passed or, uh, the, you know, whatever the circumstances may be. So that is the account level stuff. Now we can look at the archives. Every account has one or multiple archives, and you're going to want to know what to do with those. And an owner of an archive gets to determine what the legacy plan is for their archive. So here's what a completed archive level plan uh, we may have decided or chosen. You may have chosen for one of your archives. And there's a couple nice touches here. Um, for one thing, you may have decided not to do anything for two months after your plan has been activated. So we might have been notified of your death, but you may have chosen to delay any actions occurring inside the platform on your archives. Folks are grieving at this point, potentially. Um, there could be some confusion. Uh, you might have other reasons why you don't want to immediately release personal materials out into the world. Um, and so there's a built-in buffer if you choose to, 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 to add it. And then there's questions about what to do. Um, so you might publish your archive. You may have materials, family genealogy materials or public or stories or art that you've worked on that you've kept private up until this point, but now you wanna make it available to the public. Uh, we have a publishing mechanism on permanent uh, where you can set up public gallery pages where folks can look at any public materials that you have. So you can convert all of your archive materials to be public. You might freeze your archive and say, I don't want any changes to my archive at all by setting it to view only. So folks who had access to it might continue to have access to it, but only at the view only level. No one can make any changes at this point. You might transfer your archive to somebody else. Um, now, if you set it to view only and then transfer the ownership, if that ownership is never claimed by Rose, for example, here, uh, then um, it stays at view only. But if Rose claims that ownership, now they become the owner of this archive. So if it's a family archive, and maybe passed on to the next generation. Um, if it's an organization archive, it might be passed down to another leader in the organization. Um, so there's a lot of, there's an opportunity to transfer the archive and the stewardship of the archive. 
And lastly, archives represent people. Um, so you might have a personal archive, uh, the Robert Friedman archive. Uh, and in that metadata for that archive is a death date, um, a date of your passing. And so you might want to update that with whatever date um, we've identified as the past. So um, there's the opportunity to memorialize the archive and indicate that that person has passed. You can leave that up to the new steward, or you can have us automatically do it. So these are some options to set up inside. Uh, yep, there you go, Golden Girls. Someone got it. Um, so this is a, a nice way to set up. This is what a legacy plan would look like for the archives under your account. Um, let me walk through that step by step, show you what the steps look like a little bit. So the next slide, Maureen, is the unique plan for each archive. Um, this shows that perhaps you have more than one archive. Um, in each case, you would set those archive plans independently. Um, you may want to Robert, them. yes. Can, can you turn your sound up just a little bit? I'm not sure that I can, but I can get closer to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, you just um, went really low there for a minute. Let me, just for a moment, let me just double check the sound settings here. Let me change something and see if that improves the situation. Can you hear me all right? Oh yeah, that's much better. Oh, I should have had that set from the beginning. So there was something I could do, um, but I'm glad you can hear me well now. So um, in this case, uh, this user has uh, two different archives and they can set their archive plans independently. They may want to delete the volunteer firefighter archive because I don't know, um, or they might want to make it public. Uh, but the Sophia Petrillo archive might need to go um, into view only mode, or uh, maybe that one gets deleted because you've got some uh, uh, private information about Sophia you don't think anyone needs to see. So there's a lot of options per archive to determine what each archive is going to do. And you can create archives with the purpose of deleting them later, if that's a thing um, that you would like to do uh, as well. So uh, the next slide um, gets into, uh, let's see, the next slide gets into um, just, uh, again, the opportunity to notify a, a potential steward of um, what you would like them to do, uh, that they've been made a steward of the archive. This is the automatic notification slide. Um, and, uh, you know, if you uncheck this option, they're still going to get an invitation when the legacy plan is activated, but there's an opportunity to kind of get them in now and help them get oriented to the platform um, and understand how it all works for the future date. So we've kind of thought through the, you know, don't wait for too long to kind of um, orient folks to your legacy plan, and make them familiar with it. So uh, that kind of is a little quick, um, oh, I skipped a slide. I'm sorry. How did I do that? I, th I think they're in a different order in, uh, from when I remember them. Right. This is, <laughs> this is the access and stewardship option slide. Are we still on that slide, Maureen? Uh, yeah, we're on automated notification for archive stewards. Oh, okay. I kind of skipped past the, um, I'm looking at my notes while also, uh, uh looking at the jumping between two, uh, two tabs. So I, I think I missed the archive settings one, but that's the one that went through the different settings that I described. So yep. at this point, I think we've covered the, the general path one would take to set up an archive plan and a account plan and what that would look like. And so at this point, um, just to close out, I just want to reiterate uh, that th this was a prototype. We've just described uh, our design for this feature. We haven't built it yet. It's not functional yet. So there's a lot of opportunity to get feedback from our community, make changes and adjustments um, to improve the understanding, usability of it uh, before we launch anything. And so your feedback is essential um, and really ensures that we meet your needs. And at this point, uh, Maureen, I'm on the prototype and survey slide. Yep. Um, and here I just like to share the link, uh, which is um, a bit.ly link to the prototype. So if you follow that link, uh, you will um, reach, and I'll drop it in the chat. Uh, that if you great. follow that link, you will reach our the same prototype I just shared with you, and you can click through it. It's not connected to anything. You don't have to create an account. You don't actually do anything. You're just clicking through. Um, you do get to make choices uh, in a sort of simulated way 
Um, but you know, we're filling in all the data automatically just so you see how the process works. Um, we'd love for you to fill out the survey that comes at the end of that uh, prototype. Um, if you do, uh, we'll either uh, grant you a free gigabyte of storage on permanent in addition to the one you already get, uh, or a Target gift card um, for you to spend how, how you would like. You can enter to win a uh, Target gift card. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. The survey is fairly quick to fill out. Um, we've gotten a lot of really thoughtful feedback from folks so far um, and some really great ideas about how we can make improvements. And so we're taking those very seriously. Uh, and we'll be iterating in the next couple of months as we lead towards the launch of what well, version one. It won't have everything on the day we launch it. Um, we'll probably start with some more basic options. Perhaps not all of the automated options will be available immediately. Um, but we'll be continuing to iterate and build on it over time um, until we realize our, our full vision for this, uh, hopefully in the next year or so. So that is, uh, that's it, I think, for our... You ready for some questions? Yeah, we're ready for some questions. Um, All right, so some... we have a few questions. Uh, question number one, oh, and just for anyone that doesn't know, you can use your legacy... Um, digital legacy or permanent uh, archive for audio, video, and still photos. I mean, whatever you can digitize. Um, yeah, we so, like to say if it's made of bits, uh, we'll take it. There so, you go. Any file type. Uh, someone would like to know if it's yet possible that all metadata created in permanent will be transferred with the photo document when downloaded to a Windows PC. That is a great question. I'm going to say a few things about that. Um, one is that is on our roadmap. So embedded metadata is on our roadmap. And what I mean by that is if you make metadata changes on permanent, for us, uh, we, we have to write those changes to the file when you download them for you to keep them in the file. So what Maureen was describing as the ultimate solution. And we recognize and value that as the ultimate solution but there's some complexities around that, especially because we hire, we manage any kind of file type. So it's not just photos on permanent. And so how we set it up so that we can write metadata will look very different for every file type and where we start. And so it gets a little complex with us, but here's a couple of things you should know. First, we always preserve the original file. So any metadata editing you did outside of permanent on upload is all preserved. We never delete any metadata and you can always extract it back. So if you didn't make any changes on permanent and you just uploaded files and then downloaded them, you'd get back what you gave us, the way you gave it to us, no changes made. So that's an important thing to know because um, it allows you to make all your metadata changes offline and then upload them to permanent with confidence that not only will they be there when you download them, but we read them and make them searchable and editable. So you'll be able to see all of that inside the platform as well. Um, so any work you do outside of permanent, you will see inside of permanent. We're now how working does, on reverse. How does permanent compare to or differ from forever? Uh, I, another good question. Um, I think I, I always like to say we're working on very similar problems. Uh, we are very supportive of all the organizations out there working on preserving family history and legacy. Um, I think some of the things that make us different and unique is our nonprofit status, the fact that we handle any kind of uh, document or file type, um, some of the preservation work that happens behind the scenes on permanent. So our use of multiple different backend storage facilities. So we use multiple different storage partners to preserve materials. Partnerships with the Internet Archive and other nonprofit organizations, I think, make us special as well. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of unique preservation and archival um, elements to the permanent system uh, that I think are definitely worth thinking about. And then, of course, the pay-as-you-go approach, um, the $10 per gigabyte at whatever level you need it, uh, is a nice touch, too. So a lot of overlap, but um, some uniqueness there, too. Yeah, go ahead, Maureen. Does metadata add to the size of the file? Um, typically in very insignificant ways. Like if it's a te text file, yes, but you're already talking about like bytes or kilobytes. Um, yeah. Metadata is just text. Now, there are ways to add more complex metadata, but I don't think we're talking about. No, we're not. We're not. <laughs> it's that simple. 
Um, what is Permanent.org's own legacy plan? How can one count on this archival platform outliving its creators? That's a that's a beautiful uh, question. Um, I love it. So there are a couple things uh, that were that we have done from the start um, as part of our legacy planning. The choice to be a nonprofit organization is a large part of that. Um, a lot of we, when you think about legacy and sustainability of an organization, you think about you know the things that to put it to put it this way: the things that kill an organization aren't the same things. Um, to end the life of a living thing. Um, and so we we wonder what are the things that would end the life of an organization? And in this sector, it's, you know, obviously running out of cash uh, is always a problem. But there are other fail points like being shut down by a private owner who's no longer making a sufficient profit, uh, being bought or transferred um, to be a subsidiary of another company. Um, so taking away the profit incentive, the investor incentive, means that our organization is fully focused on the preservation. The financial side of it um, is, a, is always a challenge. Uh, we need to earn revenue like anyone else, but we have a couple benefits um, that I'd like to describe. First of all, uh, we are philanthropically supported to get started. So we have a benefactor that has provided a runway for permanent, um, a, you know, wealthy individual on our board of directors that uh, wants this to be their legacy, that they want this platform and this nonprofit to be something that they leave behind. So our operating costs right now, staff um, and other requirements are covered by this philanthropist. Um, but when you buy storage on permanent, when you buy that $10 per gigabyte, I mentioned that we put that away in an investment account. We save it for the future. It's a rainy day fund. Um, and we're only spending what we earn on that investment account. And that is called an endowment. An endowment is what universities, not uh, libraries and other nonprofits use as part of their sustainability plan. So buying storage at permanent is directly contributing to that endowment, which is growing over time um, and which will allow us to persist even after our initial founder um, moves on from the project, uh, which is gonna be when we're able to self-sustain. So we've thought through a lot of the sustainability questions and we're working our hardest to ensure that we do have a legacy plan in place. All right, let's try a simpler question. What does it mean to memorialize your archive? Um, I've said a lot. Uh, Amanda, Amanda do you what does it mean question? to memorialize your archive? Um, it, I believe it just means that um, it is essentially view only. Is that right, Robert? You can uh, no, I didn't mean to put you on the, on the spot. And I was <laughs> here. For the, normally, we would have Caitlin. Um, our member success manager, but they had uh, uh, a conflict. And so I'm here for the technical bits and pieces. Um, no problem. I'm happy. Uh, the uh, memorialization for, of an account is essentially freezing the account. Um, what that means is, you know, as an account, you might have multiple archives. You might be a member of other people's archives. And where you appear throughout the platform, it'll say, you know, John Doe, deceased. Um, how exactly we do that, we're still working on. It might be a badge, it might be, uh, you know, the way that LinkedIn will do the like open to hiring. We have to figure out exactly how we represent a memorialized account. Um, that's sort of next step of the design process. For an archive, it's actually pretty basic. Every archive has a profile. Um, you can make that profile public or you can keep it private. That's the metadata for the archive. Who is this archive for? What is this archive about? If it's a person, when were they born? What, you know, where, what did they do in their life? It's just a little life story that represents the archive. When you memorialize your archive, we just add a date of death to the archive based on your legacy plan activation information. So that automatically that archive profile appears as someone who has um, passed and not as someone who is still alive. It's a pretty minor thing. An account owner can do it manually. We just create an automat automated way to do it so that if you want to set your archive to view only, as Amanda suggested, it gets taken care of without anyone else having to intervene. All right, this is a more complicated question. This is our last question, okay. which is how are you securing the data? Not just who can access it, but system protection, ensuring that did data uploaded is virus-free, hacking prevention, data encryption. Yeah. So can we um, can we make that a shorter like like is there a 
way okay. of explaining so that? The shortest possible answer is um, we use industry standard uh, procedures for um, securing data. So we use encryption on upload. We use encryption at rest. Um, we uh, use commercial storage platforms with the highest levels of security. So we're not operating our own data centers or data servers where we're you know, at risk of a hacker breaking into the permanent system. Um, we're using commercial, uh, you know, Amazon, a Backblaze. These are trusted enterprise level storage systems. Our role is moving that data from place to place as needed and making sure that it's available. Uh, but we're not putting ourselves in a position where you're worried about whether permanent has the resources to secure it. Um, we're putting it in the most secure places possible. So industry standard security is sort of the shortest way I could describe it. Um, and uh, not trying to kind of, kind of come up with our own solutions that might be buggy. Uh, and that's, you know, that's our approach. It's a pretty conservative approach, really. All right, Amanda and Robert, thank you so much for uh, doing this for uh, people that follow both you and The Photo Detective. This will be on Crowdcast and people will be able to continue to watch it. Um, and then it will move to my YouTube channel. So um, thank you so much, Maureen, for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Um, I was just going to remind folks the um, I'm dropping the link in one last time for the prototype to click on that, try it out and give us some feedback in the survey. Appreciate everyone's time. Amanda, thank you for helping organize this. Yeah, All right, thank you, you, Amanda. It's been wonderful working with you. All right. So we're going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers, y'all.